Hello everyone, uh, welcome back from lunch. Please do make your way back to your seats as quickly as possible so we can get the next session underway. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Phillips. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at ACOS um, and delighted to see so many of you in the room today and looking forward to spending the rest of the day and tomorrow. We have been tremendously grateful for the support of the ACT Government who are a gold sponsor um, of this year's conference. And many of us I know, uh, including myself, observe reforms that are happening locally here in the Territory with a great deal of interest. Um, there are things that seem to be possible here that seem to be incredibly difficult in other states and territories and indeed at the federal level. And so we have observed with interest ACT reforms um, in recent years around pill testing, marriage equality, uh, the reforms to stamp duty um, and the boost to social housing investment at a time when so many other um, states and federally are seeing declining investment. <laughs> So, um, without saying much more, I'd like to welcome Glenda Stevens um, to the stage. Glenda is the chair of the ACT Council of Service, uh, and she will introduce um, Yvette Berry, who is representing the ACT government today, um, and will facilitate some questions following her keynote. Thanks, Glenda. Thanks, Jackie. Andrew Barr, the Chief Minister of the ACT, was due to uh, give the keynote address today, but unfortunately, due, due to aeroplanes, thunderstorms, rain, lightning, those sorts of things, has given an apology. But fortunately, the ACT has some excellent women, and stepping into the breach to solve our dilemma is the Deputy Chief Minister, Yvette Berry. Yvette is the Minister for Education and Early Childhood Development. She's the Minister for Housing and Suburban Development. Minister for the Prevention of Domestic, Vi Domestic and Family Violence, Minister for Sport and Recreation, and the Minister for Wi Women. The last ACT budget said it is building a Canberra for the future. The budget noted that the government is getting on with delivering more services and infrastructure to meet our community's needs in the years ahead. So we will have an inclusive, progressive and connected community. These are big, bold declarations. And how well it's all going to go will be measured by the ACT government's new um, and being developed social measures of social, social measures of well-being indicators. Could you please welcome the Deputy Chief Minister, Yvette Berry. Thanks very much, Glenda, and thank you, Jacqueline, as well. Uh, thank you, everyone. And um, yes, you got me today, unfortunately, as Glenda said, uh, the Chief Minister was away for a couple of weeks after his marriage to his long-term partner, Anthony, and uh, he has unfortunately been delayed on his return to the ACT by weather and uh, planes. Uh, so uh, I've uh, stepped in and I hope that I will do his speech and my little bits of uh, pen that I've added to it. I hope it does justice to this uh, conference. And I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, the Ngunnawal people, and acknowledge the significant contribution that Ngunnawal people and the nation's people of this region make to this city. And I acknowledge and welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. For those of us who live in Canberra, we are very lucky to do so. We have a strong economy, good jobs and higher than average incomes. Canberra has a community supportive of initiatives and government policies that are aimed at tackling social injustices. The ACT recorded the highest yes vote in the marriage equality postal vote and we have continued to build on our reputation as the most LGBTIQ friendly city in Australia. We are the only state or territory that is proudly a refugee welcome zone. And we made a point of publicly supporting the campaign to call on the federal government to increase the New Start allowance. The reason why the ACT government has pursued these positions is the high level of engagement that the ACT government enjoys with its constituents. The unique government model in the ACT means that the government covers both local level service delivery 
as well as the state and territory government le uh, level obligations. This means that we can more effectively listen to community concerns and target resources to where they are needed most. Often, the layers of governance can make service delivery very challenging for governments that are often forced to consider issues at a macro level. I welcome the discussion that you are having over the coming days on how to harness the power of local community action to influence policy debates. Because, as we all know, that when communities organise together for a common goal, you're much likely to achieve those fantastic gains for people in our community who need it most. And of course, thanks to technology, governments now have the capability to be highly engaged, more so, in their communities. Here in the ACT, we are continuing to improve our community engagement activities to ensure that the voice of the community is an integral part of the policy development cycle. It requires diligence and resources, and it requires a government that is willing to listen and to use that feedback constructively. One of the ACT government's engagement reforms is the development of the local health and wellbeing indicators. Like many jurisdictions, we have often taken comfort from good economic conditions and statistics. However, our growth as a city and as a community will be shaped not only by the strength of the economy, but also by how we develop our city to support the overall wellbeing of Canberrans. Throughout this year, we have been working with local community on what the drivers of a quality life are and how we might measure them. With this data, the government hopes to change the way we measure success in the Territory with a greater focus on how government policy impacts on wellbeing for Canberrans. And I'm not just talking about the outcomes for typical Canberrans. We want to know that our kids are getting the best possible start in life that they can that we are addressing the needs of the elderly, those with disabilities, who, uh, those who are feeling marginalised and those who are vulnerable. The wellbeing indicators will inform policy, government priorities, investment decisions, including through the annual budget process. The community will also be able to use the wellbeing indicators to see where and for whom wellbeing is great and where it could be improved. The ACT government has partnered with the non-going, sorry, the non-government frontline community organisations to hear from people who don't usually get the chance to have their say or have their voice heard. Through these conversations, people have told us about the layers of disadvantage that they experience. People from all walks of life have told us about the challenges that they face in their day-to-day -day lives and how this affects their personal well-being. Cost of living, having a safe place to stay, having stable employment, having someone to call on and depend on, connection with friends and family and feeling safe to express your identity in public places are common concerns for many in the community. Intersectionality can also have a big impact on wellbeing. Many individuals identify as part of multiple groups, for example, LGBTIQ, and culturally and linguistically diverse people, as well as people living with disabilities. And this can make it harder to meet your daily needs, access services, or feel safe within the community. The ACT government is still having these conversations and will continue to do so until we, until we uh, launch our wellbeing framework on Canberra Day in March next year. Through the development of these indicators, the importance of inclusiveness continued to come up as a primary source of wellbeing in Canberra. We are proud of the work that we are doing to be a welcoming city, largely based on the feedback from Canberrans. The Chief Minister recently launched our Capital of Equality Strategy 2019-2023 and First Action Plan which seeks to deliver equitable outcomes for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, intersex and queer LGBTIQ people in Canberra. At its heart, the strategy seeks to ensure that the LGBTIQ people, their families and communities, are visible, valued and respected, are proud of their identity, feel included and have a sense of belonging. Like our wellbeing framework, the strategy has brought together through close collaboration between government advisory bodies as well as the community. In my portfolio responsibilities as the Minister for Education and Early Childhood Development, over the last few years, the government has embarked on one of the largest conversations 
with children and young people in our community leading to the future of education strategy and work on the ACT's early childhood strategy. More than 5,000 individual contributions have been made as part of that conversation and more than half of those contributions were from students in our schools. The ACT government believes that every child deserves a great chance at a great education and the life chances which flow from it. Our big community conversation showed that so does the ACT community. The future of education strategy responds with a focus on providing equity through responding to the needs of each individual child. And because schools are increasingly being asked to facilitate a range of services for young people, the strategy recognises that learning environments are places that bring people together as a community and enable relationships to form between people and services. I'm particularly proud of the ACT government as the first jurisdiction in Australia to commit to working towards free universal quality early childhood education for three-year-olds. We'll begin to phase that in for families who need it most from the beginning of next year. Our work on developing wellbeing indicators for the ACT has also highlighted the critical importance of having a secure, suitable and affordable place to call home. That's why the ACT government is investing in more public housing for those who need it, releasing more affordable land and delivering a strong housing pipeline to support home buyers and investing in building quality to make sure that homes that are built today last for into the future as well. And it is here that I um, mentioned the work of Susan Hellyer, uh, the ACT outgoing uh, CEO of ACTCOS in the ACT and her work in advocating for the community services sector. That 100 million investment by the ACT government is the highest per capita in the country, something she should be enormously, enormously proud of and take credit for advocating for on behalf of the community services sector. However, the ACT can never be fully effective in meeting public housing needs when it continues to pay back the Commonwealth around 50% of its national housing and homelessness agreement payments in a social housing debt, the highest repayment rate of all the states apart from the Northern Territory. If a deal can be done for Tasmania, then a deal can be done for the ACT. The government has committed to redirect the money in the ACT that it would save by not paying this debt to affordable housing initiatives. And I hope the Commonwealth can recognise the greater value that increased affordable housing in the Territory would make over the repayment of a housing debt. I know that ACOS and ACTCOS have been at the forefront of addressing the most pressing needs for an increase in the, in the rate of new start. We have publicly here in the ACT in only recent weeks uh, found that the pressures that are being put on various food pantries being run by some of our wonderful community groups around this town. And whilst the ACT government should be and is doing what it can to assist those that are doing it tough, the fundamental, fundamental detriment of the situation facing most people in this country without a job is the inadequate level of basic income support payment that they receive. I've said it once before and I'll say it again, it's time for the federal government to listen and increase the rate. It's also at this point that I draw attention to the penalty rate cuts to over 20,000 people that affected around 20,000 people in the ACT community and how this has uh, impacted on the, uh, on the um, ability for people in our community to make ends meet on their already low incomes that needs to be returned. I want to thank you all again today and I wish you all the best for your deliberations over these two days. Uh, and I know that I am going to be taking some questions soon from here, uh, but I also will be taking questions at question time in the assembly. So I will sit with you and we'll have a chat this, more, this afternoon and then I'll have to take off and take some more questions at question time. So thank you once again, thanks. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister Berry, and um, thank you for your Sorry. for vocalising your support of raising the rate for a new start and and showing that uh, some politicians are understanding the impact that such a low rate is having on people of our country. Um, given that we're a little pressed for time, I might start with some questions from from the floor and then uh, ask 
some of my own if there's none coming from the floor. Is there any questions? We have. You talked yes, about a well-being index. How did you actually measure what well-being was? Did you actually go out amongst the community and ask? And how much of the population did you actually hear a response from? Yeah, look, we did all of those things so, and still are continuing to do so, as I said, um, leading up to the uh, formal release of the Wellbeing Index on Canberra Day next year. We've actually partnered with community services organisations to make sure that we're not just hearing from um, uh, ordinary, typical Canberrans, but that we are actually hearing from people who wouldn't ordinarily get their voices heard as part of this process. So uh, that's been an important part of this. We've uh, talked to all um, sectors. I don't have a breakdown with me, but um, we've talked to all parts of the community uh, to make sure that we get those wellbeing indexes uh, in, a right, in the right place and that we understand what the community also understands of what they should be. Um, when we release the document and have completed all the consultations, all of that information will be available, but you can also, if you're here in the ACT, contribute to it still on the ACT government's Your Say website. And there's more information about the work that's happened up until now on there as well. Thank you. Um, another question? Okay. Uh, yes. Hi, my name's Leslie. I'm here for a number of reasons, but I'll put one of my hats on. I'm part of the Mental Illness Fellowship of Australia in New South Wales, which is one door. You didn't mention anything about people with psychosocial disabilities or those people who are marginally housed or housing. Um, I'm not sure what Canberra's doing regarding the disability supported housing accommodation that's available to those with disabilities who need supported housing, which is greater than 17 or 24 hours. What are you doing here in Canberra to address those needs of that community? Uh, well, there there are a couple of examples that I can give you which might not make any sense to you if you're not from here, but uh, we've uh, just opened a, um, a housing for exactly the people that you're referring to, which has 24-hour care, seven days a week, uh, in Florey. So that was a partnership between um, my directorate in housing and, the mental, and uh, with the Minister for Mental Health to make sure that they got housing first as well as uh, that support 20, uh, across the day and uh, through, throughout the week. Um, and there are also, we've partnershiped with, um, um, we're partnering with, uh, oh gosh, now I've gone blank on the name, but it's more for people with disabilities, but making sure that they have those supports 24 seven. And what we've found is they've been able to in these circumstances, pull their NDIS packages together to make sure that they have that ongoing support. Um, so that's the first one that we've done in Flory, uh, and we're hoping to do another one uh, this year. I, um, I don't know how to provide you with that information if you wanted more detail on it, but uh, I'm sure there's a way we can do that if you wanted to get in touch with my office or maybe through ACOS. Yes, ACOS. Is there an another question? Oh, thank you, Minister Berry, for filling in. You are one of the most, well, you probably are the most progressive uh, territory in the country, and I want to congratulate on that. There's still things missing, but closest thing to Jacinda Ardern that I've heard to, in the conference so far. Uh, I want to ask you, I don't understand the territory state public housing debt so I'd like to get a better understanding of how that actually happens. The second question I have is, in the COAG meetings, given that Tasmania had their debt waived due to Lamb, uh, Senator Lambie, um, <clears throat> are you going to ask for the same thing to try and get the domino effect with, other with the Northern Territory and other states? Because I think it's really important to wipe that debt, in my view. And, and then get social housing moving. Yep. Um, look, it's a historic debt from before self-government, uh, which was provided by the federal government to build public housing in the ACT. Uh, but we've been paying it off for decades, the same as Tasmania and others. And uh, whilst Tasmania have had their debt relieved, um, the ACT, despite our um, numerous requests, 
uh, from the federal government to have our debt waived or the interest rates reduced so that we can then put even more money into growing our public housing in the ACT. So far, we haven't heard uh, any positive responses from the federal government. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, and I guess if we are able to be successful in negotiating an outcome with the federal government, then I would hope they would provide the same opportunities to other states and territories. Yep. So I'm going to have to cut you short. I'm going to have to jump in here, sorry. Um, we've got a machine here and people over there saying we have to wrap up now. Thank you for that question and we will take it on notice. And um, You can get in touch with my office and I can talk with you more. Yes. Okay, okay. thanks. And thank you very much for stepping in and uh, coming to speak to us today and talking about the social world, uh, wellbeing indicators and what the ACT government is doing for our territory. So thank you very much. Could you please thank Yvette. Thanks to Glenda and to the Deputy Chief Minister for stepping in at the last minute. Um, and Ricky, to that question, um, certainly as a COS network, we are doing some strategic thinking at the moment about how we work more effectively to with COAG to, and to influence COAG's agenda around some of those issues that you've highlighted. Um, and certainly representatives from some of the COSs will be meeting on Thursday to continue that discussion. So it's a really good question. Um, so I'll straight after this, we're going to move really quickly into our breakout sessions. We're already, we've already eaten into a few minutes um, of those sessions, and there's some really exciting uh, sessions running parallel. If you've registered for Abigail Scott Paul's masterclass, you can stay put in this room um, where it's being held. For the other sessions, you'll need to leave this room, and there'll be signposts um, along the hall, I think, mainly, to the other breakout rooms um, along the way. Um, I was going to say a few other things about uh, the ACT's um, various developments, but I might hold those thoughts for now, except to say that we, of course, also want to pay tribute to Susan Hellier um, and all of the fantastic work that she did in her time at ACTCOS um, as a wonderful um, advocate for social justice, um, as a great ally um, and colleague um, for all of us um, at ACOS and as just an all-round lovely person. Um, so we will miss Susan greatly. So, without further ado, um, please do move into your breakout sessions and we'll see you after afternoon tea, which follow the breakouts. Thanks.